Bruce Van Nata loved trucks, and his job as a self-employed diesel mechanic helped this Christian family man live out his power truck dreams and provide for his wife and four children. He never gave a second thought to the dangers of working on engines that weighed thousands of pounds until November 16th, 2006. I was working on a Peterbilt logging truck about an hour from our home, and the guy that I was working with that day, the driver of the truck, asked me if I would look and try and diagnose one more problem, one more leak before I left. So if you can picture one of these great big Peterbilt trucks, here's the front bumper. And I slipped underneath that great big chrome bumper feet first. And he had had the front axle jacked up in the air and the passenger side wheel removed. The axle is going right across my chest at this point, maybe an inch or two above my chest. Then just as Bruce slipped under the truck, the 20-ton capacity jack holding up the truck shot out from its position and this 10,000, 12,000 pounds of weight that is on these two front wheels on this axle came down across my midsection, basically like a blunt guillotine, and just crushed me in half. Blood had splatted the inside of my throat, the back of my throat when it fell, and I could see that there was less than an inch of airspace between the bottom of the axle and the cement. So I knew that I was thinner than it, my body was thinner than an inch. The man jacked the truck up off of me. I begged him to get me out from underneath the truck. He didn't want to because he could tell that I had to have a broken back, and I did. Um, my vertebrae and my back were cracked uh, the width of the axle. It was the most incredible pain you can think of. I've never felt any kind of pain like that. The very next thing it is, I just called out, Lord, help me. I called out twice, Lord, help me. Instantly, all of the pain left Bruce's body. At that point, my, I went unconscious. My spirit left my body floated up into the ceiling and now I'm, my spirit is looking down on the accident scene from above. The man I've been working with was on his knees above my body. He's talking, I can hear him talking, he's saying things like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But on each side of him, also on their knees, was a huge angel. Their heads stuck up at least this much taller than his head. So if you would have stood them up, they would have had to been like eight feet tall. They did not have wings, they were just very broad shoulders again. Between the two angels and him, it took up the whole front of his truck. There was a bright light shining around each one of them. They were matching bookends. They looked identical. They just had their arms underneath the truck, not holding the truck up, but had their arms angled in towards my body. There was no pain. In fact, just peace. And I can't even describe, words can't describe the peace that I felt in the ceiling. Bruce knew he had a serious choice to make. I was definitely on the point, on the verge of life and death. There were two voices, thoughts in my head. One was, shut your eyes, give up and die, and you're just gonna go to heaven anyway. It was very loud. There was another voice in my head, thought, much quieter, more of a whisper, and that one said, if you wanna live, you're gonna have to fight, and it's gonna be a hard fight. And next thing I knew, my spirit went back down into my body like that, just like a shot. Bruce was conscious as he was flown on a life flight to the hospital. Doctors there doubted he would even survive the next few hours. His ribs were broken, his pancreas and spleen crushed, and several major arteries had been severed. I had five major places, five places that major arteries were completely severed. I found out from uh, doctors that there was a medical study done in 2001. According to that study by the University of Southern California, they've used my case and compared it against that study. And according to that, they can't find anyone else in the world that's ever lived with five major arteries being severed. So I should have bled to death in just a few minutes. So my thought is the angels were there to hold my, somehow hold me together. Bruce stayed in the hospital for over two months and survived five major surgeries. Yet he had overwhelming obstacles to overcome. Almost 75% of his small intestines were crushed in the accident and had to be removed. Adult has 18 to 20 some feet of small intestine, they say, roughly. Somebody came in and told us, they didn't expect me to live much more than a year. I'm going to starve to death. I was losing weight very rapidly. They're feeding me intravenously. Bruce's once 180-pound frame dropped to 126 pounds. But Bruce's family was praying, and his community rallied around him. Then Bruce received an unexpected visitor in his hospital room one day. The Lord woke up a man in New York two days in a row, someone that I met one time on vacation. And he came and prayed for me in the hospital put his palm on my forehead, and when he prayed, uh, he 
prayed the way Jesus taught us to pray, and he spoke to the mountain, in this case, my intestine. And he said, small intestine, I command you to supernaturally grow back in length in the name of Jesus Christ. And when he did, it felt like 220 volts came out of his palm into my forehead, right into my body, and I could feel my intestines moving around and going up and down. After a long nine months of surgeries and hospital stays, Bruce was eventually able to feed himself, and he gained weight all the way up to 170 pounds. When he returned for testing, radiology reports and doctors confirmed that he had almost nine feet of small intestine. His intestines had doubled in length. When they test me, uh, they say that the intestines that the Lord gave me back were twice as good as normal. Even though I don't have my full amount, he gave me several feet back. Even though it's half as much, they absorb the vitamins, the minerals, the nutrients that I eat into my body normally. Over and over, the Lord kept confounding the doctors from the, from the point of them saying that I shouldn't have lived, I should have bled to death, to my intestines miraculously, intestines miraculously coming back. Over and over, uh, God was showing that miracles are happening. My pancreas rejuvenated by itself, my spleen rejuvenated by itself. Miracle after miracle after miracle, God just kept showing up and showing himself very real and strong that he is the miracle worker. Today, through their organization, Sweetbread Ministries, Bruce and his family travel together to talk about supernatural healing. Bruce has also written a book called Saved by Angels. Miracle after miracle after miracle. It's exciting to just see what God is doing in people's lives today and that he is alive and well and he wants to reach people at their point of need. And so we've got a God that loves us more than we can ever imagine. And he pours out his love on us in such an amazing way that it's indescribable. felt like I was fading away. Next thing I knew, Where? off of the distance, I saw white light. Jim Where? Anderson was dying from a massive heart attack. The only signs of trouble came a year earlier, but his doctor called the symptoms stress-related. Jim was working 12-hour days as a supervisor at a wastewater treatment plant. But this time, Jim knew it was much more than stress. I was uh, resting in my bedroom, and all of a sudden I had a crushing pain in my chest, and uh, the pain radiated down the arm, up the side of the neck, couldn't catch my breath. And I called to my daughter, I said, you're going to have to get me to the hospital, I'm not going to make it. A balloon catheter was inserted into his artery. He was stabilized and placed on a heart transplant list. But two days later, Jim flatlined. I could see everyone rushing into the room, but I couldn't hear the alarms going off. It's like I had gone underwater. The, the hearing had just, just faded away. That's when I began to pray. I knew I was dying. It wasn't a scare praying. It was earnest to take care of my family. As I prayed, it got darker to the point it went black. Next thing I knew, off of this distance, I saw white light. It was beautiful. Just wasn't blinding, but pure, perfect. As I started to go towards the light, I could see the out, outer edge of it begin to spiral. And I couldn't figure out what that was, but as I got closer, I could see it was the words of prayers revolving. The words broke off going into the light, and I followed into the light. The next thing I felt was being embraced, safe and secure. It felt wonderful. It felt like total love. Next thing I knew, I was looking down the room where my body was. I could see everyone working on me. I could hear what they were saying. There were two nurses outside of the room looking in. One said to the other, why are they working so hard? He's gone. If they do bring him back, he'd be a vegetable. I later on told her what she said. She about passed out. <laughs> then it 
then I thought to myself, where's Tabby? And instantly I was in the room where she was. And I'd just gotten finished with that prayer. Uh, you know, he's yours, Lord, because I knew that that was the only way he was coming back to us. God wanted him to. When she did that, he's yours. I zoomed right in on her face. When I saw her face, I saw every aspect of our life together. From the first day we met, our marriage, the birth of our children, all the emotions we've shared. I couldn't leave her. I just couldn't leave her. And I cried out to the Lord. I said, Lord, I love you so much, but please let me go back. I said, my wife needs me. My children need me so much. Please let me go back. The doctors and nurses didn't give up. They shocked Jim so many times that the flesh on his chest was burned. Then the doctors heard a heartbeat. I came back to a world of pain. They shocked me so many times. It's like coming back out of order. Just, just my hearing came back. I could hear them telling me, I can't believe it, he's back, he's back. I said, can you hear me? <laughs> and I took that first breath on my own. Have you ever tasted honeysuckle? That's exactly what that first breath tasted like. It was so sweet, so wonderful. And I just thank the Lord. Jim was alive, but his heart still wasn't functioning properly. They put him into a, a coma, a medical Medicaid coma, and uh, to allow his body to heal. So I wasn't able to talk to him for days. Jim spent the next 17 days in intensive care. He flatlined several more times. And each time, Jesus asked him a question. The subsequent times that I arrested and would go towards the light, he would ask, are you sure this is what you want? And each time I would ask to come back. Jim woke up from his medical-induced coma. His heart increased in function from 5% to 30%. He no longer needed a heart transplant. It was a long process, but basically it was uh, good to hear his voice again. <laughs> Very good to hear his voice again. His doctor implanted a pacemaker in his chest. Just a couple of days later, Jim was able to make it home in time for his daughter's graduation. One doctor told Jim he only had a year to live. That was over seven years ago. It's brought us closer together, so much closer together. Um, we talk about things now, and it, it's whatever needs to be done for the day, it, it's done. You know, we don't, don't focus on things that are trivial. Jim knows that every day he has with his family is a blessing from Jesus Christ. I try to witness to at least one person a day to let them know this isn't about me. It's about their life. And to know that he is there for them. That he loves them. How old are you today? Me. And what is your name? And where do you live? In Nebraska. Who's your mommy? Sonia. Who's your daddy? Daddy Popo. Who's your sister? Cassie. That was 10 years ago. Looking at Colton now, you would have never guessed that he almost died in 2003. His father, Todd, tells about Colton's near-death experience in the book, Heaven is for Real. And he started throwing up into the toilet, you know, and uh, at first we're like, okay, he's got the stomach flu because the doctor said it was going around. Colton's condition only got worse as days passed. His doctor discovered his appendix had burst and infection was spreading in his body. 
time was running out. And we knew we were in bad shape when they, they say, well, you need to come out to the hallway. They separated us from everyone else. And then someone came to us and started talking to us that uh, we got to have surgery on your kid. It was tough. Um, seeing your boy be lifeless when he was a very vibrant child. And it was at that moment that we were looking at each other. I remember my wife holding Colton in that hallway, just us. He's not even moving. We went to the surgery prep area, and I remember them hauling him away and him just yelling at me, Daddy, don't let him take me. Daddy, don't let him take me. And I went back to the, uh, uh, the pre-op room where we had left some stuff, and I was finally alone, shut the door, and I just broke down, and I was mad at God. I just frustrated, fed up. And I remember telling him, I said, God, after all I've done for you, and now you're going to take my kid? This is how you treat your pastors. And I was calling our prayer chain. I was calling anybody that would be on the other line to get Colton on the prayer chain because it was bad. We were there in the waiting room for an hour and a half, maybe. Then I remember the nurse coming out. Uh, is Colton's daddy out here? I'm like, yeah, well, Colton's a, a, a in recovery and he's screaming for you. And I'm sitting there with him. And I remember my son in that room then looking up at me and goes, Dad, do you know I almost died? And my first thought was, maybe overheard the nurse say that, or maybe they thought he was under anesthesia, you know, and, and he wasn't. But it wasn't until four months after we got out of the hospital that we finally listened to our son. And that's where I got to see heaven. No, Jesus and some angels came and flew me up to heaven. And I said, so Colton, what did Jesus look like? I knew that the first person I saw was Jesus. He was wearing white robes with a purple sash and he just came down nicely and gracefully well dad jesus has markers dad jesus has markers i didn't know what he meant so i finally asked the right question colton where are jesus markers and he drops his toys down and he stands up and he just points dad they were right here he takes his fingers points to the palms then he bends over and touches the tops of his feet and looks up to me, that's where Jesus' markers were, Dad. When I was in the throne room of God to start with, so I got to see what that looked like. I was upset because I didn't know what was happening. What God did is he used people that, people or things that I liked to calm me down. From there on, I felt better. And one day we're traveling together and he looks up at me and, Dad, you used to have a grandpa named Pop, didn't you? I'm like, yeah, he's really nice. Really? Yeah, you used to play with him as a kid and fix, work with him on the farm and, and shoot stuff with him. I'm like, yeah, how do you know that? Well, he told me. A figure came up and he was Pop. He asked me, are you Todd's son? I said, yes. He said that he was his grandpa. So that's where I met him. Yeah, Pop, uh, I was very close to him. And he was my most significant male role model when I was a kid growing up. Kid, but he was killed in a car wreck before I turned seven. Um, I was busy paying bills again, because um, that's um, my job. And he came up and told me he had two sisters. Well, he had to say it several times before he finally got my attention. And finally, I put myself down and looked at him and says, what do you mean you have two sis sisters? No, I have two sisters. You had a baby dying in your tummy. And I just looked at him like, well, how do you know you have two sisters? Well, she told me. And then he proceeded to describe her. She looked like Cassie, but she had brown hair. And first time when she saw me, she just came up and hugged me. We knew this was true because he said she kept hugging me. She wouldn't stop hugging me, Mom, and I didn't like that. Well, I'm not really the hugging type. I had miscarried the weekend of Father's Day weekend, which made it even rougher. And we thought we'd dealt with it. We got over, we accepted that the baby had died. But when he said he had two sisters, I was, I think I was in shock first and then trying to realize, what is he telling me? And so I knew that he had seen her and after he described her, and he said, she's just, she just waiting for you guys to come to heaven. You know, as we talked about heaven and he was telling me all these wonderful details, I just felt like I had to ask him, did he want to come back? I knew that I was leaving heaven because Jesus came to me and said, Colton, you need to go back. 
Even though I didn't want to go back, he said that he was answering my dad's prayer. I remember that prayer. That irreverent, that disrespectful, screaming at God prayer. <laughs> I was like, he's answering that prayer? Today, Colton is a healthy 13-year-old and shares his heavenly journey with boldness. I learned that heaven is for real and you're going to like it. I was convinced that there was no way to live a completely happy life. And if I couldn't live happy, I didn't want to live at all. It began with a divorce, a broken home. And I believe that through that, my mentality began to form and began to develop a sense of rejection because I didn't understand. I was a small child and didn't understand adult things. And so I, I felt the breakup was all about me that sense of rejection just really grew. I began to perceive myself as a burden to other people. And so I would take little bitty comments that were relatively insignificant. I would make it into a really big deal. Those little seeds in my life, I began meditating on over and over. And as I grew, the rejection began to grow. What is wrong with me? And so I believe that the only answer for me was to end my life. I walked um, to my mother's room thinking I don't want anyone to see me because I'm so determined to end my life, to end the void, to 